I've just completed a trip to Johannesburg and you'll never guess, I lost my iPhone, in fact it was stolen. But I've replaced it with a new one. And our guest today, David Cameron of Webjet, explains that this instrument, this latest iPhone, is going to double the size of his business. And if it can double his business, it's going to transform a whole range of other enterprises. In fact, David Cameron says that in this new iPhone, we could be looking at something nearly as important as the PC in transforming businesses. And so, over to David Cameron, Webjet. David, at Webjet, you've transformed the airline booking systems. How did you devise um, this internet way of doing it? Sure, when we started Webjet, which was essentially on the eve of the dot-com crash in 2000, we had a couple of very clear concepts which were radically different to the competitors that existed then or in fact have subsequently come into the landscape. The first issue was that there were 4,000 travel agents in Australia. We had to define a set of values that was different to that landscape and be prepared to walk away from business where we couldn't transact it online. In other words, we would not be a hybrid. We would not try and be all things to all people. We would focus on doing business that could be transacted essentially without human intervention. The customer, putting it crudely, would do the work. And of course, it was very tempting when you're starting as a business that had no business to literally take a decision to walk away from business. So that was the first singular difference. Um, the second was that we were not going to build the company to rely on short-term share price appreciation. We would build a transaction model where our income was paid for by the customer, not the airline, and in the longer term, we'd have a sustainable business. And that was a hard decision because most competitors at that time and most of the dot-com companies were all looking for short-term share price gain. Okay. And we were obviously under enormous pressure to do that, so we resisted that. And the third very particular difference was we would not be hijacked and live in cyberspace. We were dealing with people that were traveling in the real world, that lived in the real world. We would use the internet to get economy of scale and cheap distribution, but build a trust mark, a brand, in the physical world. Okay. They were the three differences. And nobody else did that? No, they didn't. They were seduced by external factors. Quick back on the internet, all things to all people, take a traditional travel agency model and dump it onto the internet and pick up the telephone and answer the customer's inquiries and take the bookings. Our view was no value in that. We couldn't have a lower cost of operation if we did that. We had 4,000 travel agents to compete against who were doing just that. Now you're going to America and Asia. Have people in America done what you have done? To a degree, but on a quite different basis. Most of the large American operations, such as Expedia, Orbitz, Travelocity, who are gigantic in terms of world footprint, have a very different business model. Firstly, they had their origins in domestic business in America, multiplicity of carriers, high income streams, major hotel sales. So they have call centers and they have service centers, but they're operating in a very, very different market to us. So they've uh, obviously succeeded spectacularly, but they haven't in Australia. The relative size of Webjet in Australia with whatever publicly available data exists for Expedia suggests we've got a market footprint of two or three times. So you're going to take them on in America as well? <laughs> <laughs> we wish. No, <laughs> we don't have those delusions. Uh, our American operation will be, is in fact, a niche operation. Okay. It's concentrating on long-haul leisure business across the Pacific into Australia and Asia, where of course we're starting with partnership in uh, Singapore and Hong Kong at the end of this year. So we're not taking on Expedia. That would just be suicide. Okay. Now, in the airline booking business, um, how does the market share roughly break up between the airlines themselves, flight centre, other agents and yourself? 
Hard to get exact data, but the best estimates we can give you, and I wouldn't want to try and validate it, is the airlines in their own right probably have a third of the market in the domestic space because of the operations of Jetstar, which are principally on the internet, similarly with Tiger, that percentage would be much higher. Mm -hmm. But conversely, on international business and with Qantas itself, the percentage would be lower. So let's say it's about a third. Mm -hmm. Flight centres in Australia, which would probably be the most professionally run traditional retail travel agency in the world, in my view, has probably got something very close to 30% of the market. And the rest is then divided up between other retail agencies and the online operations. And of the online, we are the dominant player. Now, what does that mean in overall market share? Somewhere between five and 10%. Okay, okay. So do you think this concentration by airlines on price, which you foster because you give people a choice, and you can see the prices, do you think that's gonna commoditize the airlines, groups like Qantas? Ah, that's a very interesting question. There's a lot of conjecture about this and a lot of what we think are misunderstandings about what commoditization means. We do not subscribe to the view that the airline industry either is now or will be commoditized. Mm -hmm. There are parts of it, mm -hmm. the lowest mm -hmm. price component of the market, mm -hmm. which is essentially replacing bus travel, which is arguably a commodity. But the rest is not, because travel is about fantasy. And even mm -hmm. business travel is about fantasy. It's an emotional experience. <laughs> right. And the airlines that have succeeded with that, best example being Singapore Airlines, despite the GFC, despite all the upheavals that the airline industry goes through on a cyclical basis, continues to gain market share, is substantially profitable, and has a superb quality product. Okay. So it comes to the second part of this issue of commoditization and price and what's the driver and what's the cause and what's the effect. We do not subscribe to the view that the market is so price sensitive that a $10 difference on a fare is going to cause you to travel mm -hmm. or a $100 price difference on an international fare would cause you to choose one airline over another. It's much broader than that. It's about service, it's about experiential uh, issues, it's about quality, it's about emotion. You go back perhaps 10 years when I used to travel a lot internationally, you'd get on a Qantas flight in London or Frankfurt or somewhere and they'd be playing Walsing Matilda or something mm -hmm. and suddenly you were home. Now that was beyond price. Yes, of course. Yes. But that's gone. Yes. Now tell me, what's this going to do to your business? The, the, we, the iPhone? We, yeah. We think the portable devices are going to be more significant than the web itself. Really? The reasons are these. Firstly, it's with you all the time. Yes. So it's with you when you need it, rather than you having to go to it. The second is the experience on the iPhone and the iPad with our application, which we released about a month ago, is a very fluid experience. It's a simpler experience. Now, whether that can be translated into highly complex itineraries, the jury's out. But for point-to-point -point travel, be it domestically or be it internationally, we see the portable devices as being phenomenally powerful. So it's going to, you could double your business? We, we believe it has that sort of scope. Really? Yeah. Um, it's transformational. Yeah, yeah. Now, you listed quite early. If you had your time again, would you list? What your experience yes. in listing? Yes, we would often been asked this question, if the choice was between private equity groups where you are ultimately captive, mm -hmm. and they call it patient capital, I've yet to see very much patience, a small group of private shareholders where there are exit strategies that become imperative and no liquidity in stock, or high debt leverage, contrast that with a shareholder base of a few thousand people no um, and you control no comparison you, you and your friends and, and, and other management can, have got more than we've got yeah we've got about 16 percent of the okay. issued equity and thornies who are a highly supportive shareholder yes. have got about 18 percent um, look the regulatory issues are irksome but in reality they're no more in our view than you would do if you were running a company prudentially and if you were running it with shareholders interests and running it responsibly. 
they're different, but they're not greater. Okay. You've got a lot on your plate. You've got this revolution, um, you've got US and a bit of Asia. Have you got the management to cope with that? Yes, we have. Uh, one of the unique things about Webjet, which is something that we're very jealous about guarding, is that our senior management group in various incarnations have known each other for a quarter of a century. Okay. So there is cohesion, there is trust. Not to say we don't agree on everything, we don't. We argue quite vociferously, but there is an underlying intrinsic trust. That's gold. Yes, yes. But you need to bring new people in. Yes, we do. But we do it in an evolutionary manner. We do it cautiously, and we do it with the expectation of long-term association. Thank you, David.